thank you guys all for being here today for our first uh, speaking event this semester for Hillcrest Praxis. Um, thank you all, uh, you know, if you were able to accommodate uh, Dr. White uh, with learning math, um, if you'd like to do so, we still have some over there. Um, additionally, if you have not had hot chocolate, we have hot chocolate, which... A little bit, not so much. A little bit, maybe not much more. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, other further announcements, uh, on October 28th, we will be uh, having uh, Richard Edling, the former president of the speaking uh, for Praxis, so keep your eyes out for that. Um, and a former Hillsdale College professor. Yeah, a former Hillsdale College professor, that is, yeah, that is true. Um, but without any uh, further delay, uh, to introduce Dr. White. Uh, Dr. White is a, uh, Larry White is a professor at George Mason Universal, uh, University. <coughs> specializing in the theory and history of banking and money. Dr. White is also the author of several books, including Clash of Economic Ideas, The Theory of Monetary Institutions, and Competition and Currency. He is involved in reaching both popular and academic audiences alike. He is an editor of the Review of Austrian Economics and on the editorial board of the Cato Journal, as well as a contributing ed editor to Thieves, the Freeman Magazine, and hosts podcasts for Econ Journal Watch. Not anymore. Oh, not anymore, yes. <laughs> The Freeman, that is. Um, Dr. White's favorite economist is Ludwig von Mises. Yay. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, so without any further delay, uh, here is Dr. White on markets versus governments and money in banking. All right. Thank you, Ben, for that introduction, and thanks again for indulging me uh, by wearing a mask. Uh, so, uh, <clears throat> there's been a lot of discussion. Uh, about monetary policy in recent years, in recent months, uh, proposals for government to issue a digi so-called digital currency. Uh, there's a, uh, a woman's been nominated by Biden to become the director of the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, who believes in eliminating the banking system and moving all checking accounts onto the books of the Federal Reserve System. You may think I'm making that up but that's the facts. Uh, so we're living in interesting times, and I think it's useful to step back and get <clears throat> a sort of historically grounded and theoretically grounded perspective on the contrast between providing monetary services, providing payment services through market institutions versus through government institutions. Far too many economists take it for granted that the monetary system has to be run by the government because hasn't it always been that way? Uh, and the answer is no. Government's been involved for an awful long time because as Willie Sutton said about why he robbed banks, that's where the money is. There's a lot of profit to be made if you're the issuer of money and I think that's the main reason for it. But if we want uh, to have a reliable monetary system, if we want sound money, we need to learn about the history and theory of how private institutions provide money, which is too often uh, never learned or forgotten. Or people have myths about, and this has been popular in, in discussion about whether we should allow uh, private firms to issue dollar denominated stable coins. Myths about how, well, when we let private banks issue money, it was all chaos and wildcat banking and fraud and everything was chaos and craziness. Not true, as it turns out. Uh, just a convenient myth. So uh, chocolate donut is my favorite example of a private good. It's a private good in the technical sense that if you consume it, nobody else can consume it. So it's rival in consumption, that's the technical phrase. And it's excludable. You can stop other people from enjoying your chocolate donut. I mean, maybe they get some enjoyment just by looking at it, but they can't actually eat it. So it's a private good. There's no obvious reason for the market to fail to provide the efficient quantity. And this is the standard technical argument for why government should produce something is the claim that it's a public good, that it's non-rival in consumption, or that exclusion isn't feasible. If we think about money, if we think about money in the basic sense of the money in your pocket, it's clearly a private good. Right? It serves you. It doesn't serve anybody else. Nobody else can spend it. 
So it doesn't provide consumption to other people and it's easy to exclude other people from using it. Uh, and yet governments supply money all over the world. So how did that happen? Uh, I'm going to argue it wasn't for good reasons, it was for unfortunate reasons. It's just uh, too much, what do I want to call it, Pollyannism or uh, Panglossianism, the idea that this must, the arrangements we have must be the best of all possible arrangements or we wouldn't have them. Uh, that's a common way of thinking uh, among even professional economists who should know better. Uh, and why isn't that true? Well, because if everything were done by voluntary trade, then you would have a prima facie case that we were enjoying the most, the best feasible arrangements. But when things are done by force, by legal restrictions, by impositions, that presumption goes out the window. We have the arrangements we have because people who had political power brought them about. And we go back in the history of money, it's pretty obvious. We got kings and emperors and dukes running things. Whereas today under democratic government, okay, it's true that the government never does anything that the public doesn't want. That was a joke. <laughs> but back then it was clearly not that way and that's the precedent that keeps being relied upon. Uh, so, what's the alternative? I mean, how could we end government control uh, and institute a free market monetary system? And at the end I'll come back around to that question, but the, the two possibilities to think about are a gold standard of a more private kind than uh, we had in the 19th century or a cryptocurrency standard. In particular, Bitcoin is the leading candidate here because it's so far ahead of other cryptocurrencies. And this is a bit of a caricature, but not much. If you ask economists how is it that money came about in the first place, there are basically two views. One is the wise king theory, that somehow the state instituted money uh, for its own purposes and the, the really naive version is in order to serve the public welfare and it, I can quote people actually saying this, <laughs> actual economists actually saying this. The alternative is a little more subtle and this is a picture of the glass hand holding the globe is supposed to represent the invisible hand. Okay, it's not quite invisible. But if it were invisible, there wouldn't be anything on the slide. So bear with me. So that Adam Smith's metaphor, the invisible hand, is a metaphor for things brought about from the bottom up through human action but not any top-down design, right? Evolved spontaneous orders. Uh, so there's a spontaneous order theory of money, which I'll say just a little about because I'm sure you've heard about it if you've taken Dr. Pongrasich's money and banking course. But it's to Karl Menger, who was also the founder of the Austrian school, uh, that we owe this, uh, the first really satisfactory statement of this theory about how uh, a money, a commonly accepted medium of exchange, that's the standard definition of money, uh, arises from the bottom up. So put yourself in the position of an asparagus farmer who's coming to market and you want to trade asparagus for the things that you want to go home and consume and let's say a plaid shirt is one of those things. It may take you a long time to find a plaid shirt seller who's willing to be paid in asparagus. Well, maybe you haven't even met the plaid shirt seller but you know that not that many people are keen on asparagus. <laughs> so if you can trade your asparagus for something else that the seller who maybe you haven't met yet who's likely, is more likely to accept, you're in a better position to trade for the stuff you want to really consume. So my example here is salt. Uh, if you trade your asparagus for salt and then use the salt to acquire your plaid shirt, we call what the salt is doing in that story serving as a medium of exchange. So early on people move from direct exchange trying to find somebody who has what they want and want what they have 
to indirect exchange where they use various media of exchange and different people use different media. Some use salt, some use pepper, some use shells, some use uh, copper. So that doesn't quite get you to money because to be money it has to be a commonly accepted medium of exchange. But if you're doing this indirect exchange and you're thinking to yourself, do I want to, somebody's offering me salt, do I want to accept salt? You look around and ask how popular is salt with other sellers. Of the people who are selling stuff that I might want to buy, <coughs> how many of them take salt? So you're on the lookout for what is a popular medium of exchange. And if you say, okay, I'll take salt because I know there's this group over here I can buy stuff using salt. You've just joined the club of salt acceptors and made it one person larger. And so in that way the network is now one person larger. That makes it more attractive to yet other people. So this, the success of something as a medium of exchange or its popularity becomes self-reinforcing. So in that way there's a convergence on a commonly accepted medium of exchange. And historically of course it was silver and gold eventually. Not right away. There were economies that used shells and uh, other things, salt actually. But silver and gold were better than those other things uh, by virtue of being more durable, more portable. Uh, and after coinage came along, uh, more uniform. Before coinage came along, it, there was some obstacle to paying people in silver if they weren't experts they didn't know what quality the silver was so they might be reluctant to accept it. But with the development of coinage, so this happens about 600 BC, uh, silver and gold become sort of head and shoulders above all the other commodity monies and when people using bulkier things like copper or things that are hard to make change in. Uh, come into contact with people using silver, they drop the uh, other money and accept payment in silver. So they, it's a kind of survival of the fittest and the other non-metallic commodity monies kind of fall by the wayside. Well the, the people who believe the wise king theory of the origin of money sometimes back up and say okay maybe, maybe it wasn't the origin of money but the standardization of money, coinage, that requires a sovereign issuer. And of course there are lots of examples, some of them over here, <laughs> of old coins with the face of a sovereign on them. A uh, famous economist named Charles Goodhart says currency becomes money primarily because the coins are struck with the insignia of sovereignty. Well there are a couple of problems with that claim. One is that if it's just the insignia that matters, why did these sovereigns make the coins out of gold and silver? If the value comes from the insignia, why not use some cheap metal? Iron, copper, well, why not use paper? And yet, up until recent times, the value of coins was based on how much gold or silver was in them, not on whose face was struck on them. So in the Middle Ages, when coins were variously worn uh, and clipped, bankers would weigh bags of coins to determine how much and they'd have to of course examine them for purity to determine how much gold and silver was in them. Uh, so there are some problems with the sovereign theory. So you go back even further, there's money with no insignias on it at all. Shells serve as money, not through any intervention of uh, sovereigns. There's an early form of silver called hack silver. It's basically little chunks of silver which are a uniform weight but they're not, uh, there's no markings on them at all. And there are early coins minted by non-sovereigns. Here's one from uh, ancient India. It's got stuff stamped on it which tells you who made it and certifies its purity and they were made in standard sizes so you know what the weight is and that's what people cared about. How much silver am I getting? Not whose face is on it. Uh, in the very earliest days of coinage in ancient Lydia which was a 
Greek civilization in what's now Turkey, it was the, the home of the famous King Midas of myth. Uh, we know there are a lot more different coins than there were kings. A lot of, there are a lot more insignias on the coins than there were kings, so we suspect that these are the insignias of private coin makers. It's advantageous to merchants to have a certification of the metal that they're being paid rather than guess how pure it is or what the weight is. Uh, of course, the Greek city-states monopolized the coinage. The Roman Empire monopolized the coinage. After the Roman Empire fell apart, there was a reflorescence of private mint masters in what was called Gaul, nowadays France and western part of Germany. And what I've studied uh, myself most closely is the 19th century experience in the U.S. There were three gold rushes in the U.S. and in, uh, one in the Southern Appalachians, the famous one in California, and then a later one in Colorado. And in each of those cases, there were private mints that sprung up to coin the money that was coming out of the hills. Uh, and the coins were quite popular. So if you want to read my article in the Economic History Review, it's coming out uh, early next year. And the other thing that, that sort of betrays this theory is that private banknotes were the most popular form of money in the 18th and 19th centuries. And they're not issued by any sovereign. There's no sovereign insignia on them. They're issued by private commercial banks. And people value them because they were redeemable for gold and silver. So here are the lessons from the uh, study I did of the private <laughs> mints uh, in the United States. It's not a completely spotless record. There were some private mint masters who set up who were incompetent. They didn't actually know how to produce coins of uniform purity or fineness. And there were some who were kind of shady, uh, who produced coins that were underweight, knowing what they were doing, but you know, stamped $5, but didn't have as much gold as a $5 coin was supposed to have. But the good part of this story, the interesting part of the story is they didn't last. The word got out. People would have the coins expertly assayed and the newspapers would publish the result. So these bad mints didn't last more than a couple of months before they were found out and then people would stop bringing them metal to coin because you don't want a coin that nobody trusts. You want to take your metal to a trustworthy mint, then it's easier to spend. Uh, so there's a, a pretty rapid uh, weeding out of the bad mints and the new mints that take their place have caught on that honesty is the most profitable policy. So they stayed in business. But over the big sweep of history, the reason governments monopolize the mints is not because the markets can't do it uh, and not because markets can't guarantee the quality of the coins, but that it's a source of revenue. Uh, I don't really have time to go into the details, but uh, you can make a big profit running the mint either by charging high fees for the service or by fraudulently debasing the coinage, mixing more crude metal in non-precious metal, tin or copper, and claiming that it's still a silver coin. And that's what government mints have notoriously done. So the lesson for the current debate over whether central banks should issue digital currency Look, we've already got digital currency issued by private enterprises. We've got private banks issuing deposits that can be transferred electronically. We've got Venmo. We've got Alipay. There are all kinds of private digital currencies. They're perfectly trustworthy. Uh, there isn't any market failure here for government to remedy. So why do governments want to issue digital currency? CA. <laughs> Profit. Well, profit and maybe surveillance. That's why they're doing it in China. If everybody's account is on the books of the central of the government owned bank or the central bank, then everybody's spending can be tracked down to the smallest transaction. Would government want to do that? 
Well, I believe Janet Yellen just said she would like to track everything down to $600. Not for the sake of surveilling you and me, of course, but for the sake of catching billionaires, which makes you wonder how she came up with $600. Right, currently the threshold is $10,000 for your transactions to be reported. And they're not very good at catching money launderers uh, right now. They can't find the needle in the haystack of transactions that are reported. So I hardly think that adding more hay to the stack is going to help. <laughs> but the ancient rulers charged high fees. They debased the coins. And to make it clear that it was monopoly that they were interested in, they often banned the use of foreign coins. And the National Mint was often the only place you were allowed to sell your silver. If you were a silver miner, you had to take it and sell it to the government at a price the government dictated. Trying to sneak it out of the country, which people did, of course, was a crime. Uh, and that way they could pay less for it at the Mint and make a bigger profit producing coins. This is a well-known. Uh, picture of the decline of the uh, Roman silver coins, they became less and less silver and more and more tarnish. <laughs> this uh, picture, by the way, which has been in, I've been using it in slides for years, just appeared in an opinion piece by Edward Snowden, who weighed in on central bank digital currency and said, in the fashion of Admiral Akbar, it's a trap. <laughs> it's all about surveillance. <coughs> Don't fall for it. Well, uh, when the government started debasing coins, private enterprise came to the rescue. Uh, by 1200 AD, we know that in Italy, private bankers were offering basically checking accounts, transferable deposits. Mm. and. People used them in part because they overcame the problem of debasement. With debasement, you don't know what the coin is worth. You have to have some expert look at it. That's a hassle. That's expensive. When you take it to the banker, uh, he examines it. He knows which coins are worth how much, how pure they are. And he weighs the coins. So here's the symbol of the Italian banker. He's got a scale in his left hand. So he's weighing a bag of coins against the standard weights here. And then he's writing down in his book how much credit the depositor gets for this bag of coins. But the bankers didn't record the credits in the names of the coins, in ducats or in florins, because their silver content changes from year to year. He records it in pure silver units, either some coin that used to be undebased or just grams or ounces of silver. And in that way, when you pay somebody with bank-issued money, with claims on the banker, you know exactly what you're getting, how many ounces of silver you're getting. And then you can come claim it from the banker, and then he'll weigh out coins equivalent containing that much silver. So it's more uniform than debased coins. It's also more portable than carrying bags of coins around, especially if you're doing long-distance trade. So they had big trade fairs in the Middle Ages where instead of everybody bringing money to the fair uh, and then having to take money home again, you just bring your banker. <laughs> you make trades with people and you tote up your, you run a tab with everybody and then at the end of the trading day, the banker clears it all up and transfers on his books what net obligations people have to each other. After uh, transferable deposits became popular a few centuries later, banks begin to issue banknotes, paper currency. So here's one of the earliest ones I could find a picture of. And it kind of looks like a check. It's got the amount written in in hand, 40 pounds. But it says, promise to pay to, and it has a name on it of the person who uh, withdrew this, or bearer. And bearer means whoever brings this note in we'll give them 40 pounds in silver. So it's a bearer instrument. That makes it different from a check, which only gets used once and then has to be deposited. Right? But a banknote can continue circulating, and the bank doesn't know who's got it at any particular moment. So it doesn't use the clearing system. It circulates anonymously. Uh, that's advantageous for many purposes. 
Here's a banknote from California in the 1860s and this one's particularly clear about what the obligation is. Redeemable in gold coin, uh, $100, oh, sorry, $10, will pay $10 to bearer, there's no name anymore, just anybody who's got it, in gold coin at our office on demand. Right, so that's the banknote contract. Uh, now, some of you may be familiar with the claim, the argument that there's something fishy about banks issuing these claims and not having a gold coin for every claim that it issues, not operating simply a money warehouse, instead taking in some of the uh, deposits and lending them out again. And the question is, are the depositors agreeing to this? Right? So if the depositors are doing this knowingly, they're authorizing the bank to lend out the money they bring in, then it's hard to see that it's fraudulent. And in fact, in the Middle Ages, it became clear early on how to uh, distinguish warehousing from deposit banking, which this, uh, the banknotes I just showed you are IOUs. So you're lending the money to the banker and you have the right to claim it back. Uh, and namely, the practice in the Middle Ages was if you want, just wanted your money stored, then you wanted exactly the same coins back, you brought it in a bag and you sealed the bag with wax. And then the banker would put it in a corner of his vault and you would pay a storage fee, but he wouldn't go into the bag. And you had a different relationship than somebody who the banker just owed money to. You had a legal relationship known as a bailment. But if you wanted, say, no storage fees and you wanted interest on your account, you brought in loose coins. And by doing that, you were saying, I don't care to get the exact same coins back. I just want equivalent coins. And the great thing about coins is that they're interchangeable. Uh, well, at least if they're uniform. Right? They're fungible. The one unit is just as good as another. Uh, and so fully informed customers were agreeing to this because they didn't just want storage, they wanted to be able to make payments. They wanted to be able to write checks to people. And it was kind of a bonus to get interest on the account and not pay storage fees. No need to pay storage because the 90% of the gold isn't in the vault, it's lent out to people. Uh, so that was the agreement with deposits. And with banknotes, you really can't have 100% reserve banknotes because as I said, they circulate anonymously so who's going to pay the storage fees? The bank doesn't know who to assess storage fees on. Okay, in this kind of system where banks are issuing claims to gold or silver, it's sometimes worried that you're going to have a confusion of floating exchange rates among the banks. And no, it's not in the interest of a bank to allow its claims to fluctuate against their face value. It's in the banker's interest that the banknotes circulate at 100 cents on the dollar and that the checks be accepted at 100 cents on the dollar. And so bankers made agree agreements with one another to bring that about. I'll accept your notes at face value if you accept my notes at face value and that way we both do more business. Our customers will use banknotes instead of coins. Uh, one of the earliest examples is in uh, Scotland, which is one of the earliest uh, developing banking systems. And it develops the earliest. It, they have all kinds of technical uh, improvements in Scottish banking. They invent or uh, develop at least branch banking, uh, overdraft accounts, uh, small loans uh, of certain kinds. Anyway, the, the bankers in Edinburgh get together and swap their claims on each other. That's a clearinghouse. And it's, it's first for banknotes, but as payment by check becomes more popular, they include checks. In the US, the, a bank in Boston called the Suffolk Bank, you may have heard of, had a note exchange <coughs> system that eventually incorporated all of New England. So if, at least in the New England part of the country, banknotes circulated at par value. You didn't have the confusion of not knowing what your banknote was worth. 
Now, in other parts of the country, you did have that problem <coughs> because the population density was low and banks weren't allowed to branch across state lines. So they weren't allowed to set up redemption offices in the main financial centers. Often, the bank was only allowed to have one office in the town that it was located <laughs> in. Uh, so, unfortunately, it wasn't more common in the U.S. outside of New England. But that was because of legal restrictions, not because of some failure of the banks. And we saw this picture, this story kind of recreate itself in the creation of ATM networks. There was no law that said banks have to accept ATM cards from other banks and give access to their cash to people whose accounts are at other banks. But they started doing this even before they started charging fees for it. Now, of course, they do it because they're charging fees for it. Most recently, there's a uh, co-op formed by, it, initially it was a couple dozen banks, now it's hundreds of banks, called the Zelle system, maybe you've used it, where you can transfer money online to somebody who's at another bank. Instantly, no fees. Nobody forced the banks to do this, but they do it because it helps attract customers to say, I'm a member of the Zelle network. Therefore, your account is easier to spend. So, in a freely evolved banking system, you have a gold or silver standard. That's the definitive money. Uh, some, th if you call it the dollar, well, a dollar is defined as so much silver <laughs> or as so much gold. In the U.S., the dollar was originally defined in terms of silver because the, the original dollar was a silver coin. Later, Congress, well, for rent-seeking purposes, defined the dollar in terms of gold that was a benefit to the gold miners. Uh, and we were mostly on a gold standard until the uh, end of the 19th century. But people didn't use coins all that commonly. People used banknotes and checking accounts uh, to pay each other. And you got many issuers of these claims. They're all denominated in the specie <coughs> unit. In the US, it was the dollar. They're widely accepted at par. Well, in most countries, a little less so in the U.S. Uh, but the banks are linked together through this agreement to accept one another's liabilities. They also agree to exchange them at the clearinghouse. But there's no central bank in this story. And there's no need for a central bank. Right? The amount of centralization that's useful is in the clearinghouse association. And that's formed voluntarily by the banks in their own self-interest because they do more business that way. <coughs> it makes money better for the customers than it's better for the banks. So that's what you see, uh, especially in the countries with the least re regulation of banking. So Scotland, I've mentioned, Canada, Sweden, Switzerland. Lots of countries have long periods before they institute a central bank. Oh, well, here's my list. Uh, I had a former student write a paper where he tried to find all the examples he could of countries or territories or colonies with jurisdictions that had competitive note issue, and he found more than 60 cases. Uh, creating a central bank was something that was debated at the time, so it was by no means inevitable, but the argument for a competition over a monopoly uh, in note issue was championed by a group I call the British Free Banking School. And they said, look, if you have just one issuer, and remember these are redeemable claims, <clears throat> they're more likely to overissue. So let's say issue 10% more banknotes than the public wants to hold. And then what happens? Well, the extra 10% gets redeemed, and now the bank has a problem because it's running out of reserves and has to slam on the brakes. So you get a credit expansion followed by a sudden credit contraction. You get business cycles if they have one issuer and they make a mistake. Whereas if you have many issuers, so let's say you have 20 issuers, and one of them makes a mistake of the same magnitude, but it's only 1, 5% of the system. So the system as a whole is not having an overissue. 
of nearly the same size. And besides, some other bank may be other under issuing at the same time. So you get, you don't put all your eggs in one basket. You smooth out behavior of the money supply uh, just by decentralizing it. When an issuer, uh, when a bank issues too many notes, they're going to come back for redemption and it's going to lose reserves. That's called adverse clearing. That's going to work very promptly. So the Scottish bankers said notes come back in a week or so. We can't persistently have too many notes in circulation. But in England, where the Bank of England had a monopoly on note issue, they could keep over issuing until gold started to leave the country, which took longer. And so it was a much slower process of correction. And there was a bigger mistake before the correction was triggered in the first place. So that's a problem. That gives you more scope for over issues of money that create boom bust cycles. Some critics of free banking have said, well, but what if all the banks over issued in unison? They all got together and said, let's expand by 10%. Uh, and I have two responses to that. One, why would they do that? <laughs> There's no historical example of all the banks getting together. Uh, a bank that stayed out of this agreement would do better by staying out. So it's subject, like most cartels, to the problem of being unstable because it pays you not to participate in the cartel if everybody else is. And lastly, if all the banks got together, they wouldn't want to issue more. What does a monopolist do to get more profit? Produce less, restrict output, get a higher price per unit. So if all the banks could conspire, they would say to each other, let's pay less on deposits and let's charge more on loans. Let's get a bigger spread between those two rates. We'll do less business, but that's OK because we're going to do bigger profit per unit of business. That's what they would do if they could collude. And yet that's not the scenario that worries uh, critics. Uh, anyway, the policy implication of this is, is you're better off with decentralization instead of having a single <coughs> point of failure. So allow free entry into money issue. Historically, of course, uh, government central banks took over, not because of market forces. It's not a natural process that gives rise to central banks. It's a political process. So the Bank of England gets a monopoly in banknotes, and they're kind of the leading example that other countries copy. Uh, and when they monopolize banknotes, other commercial banks in the system no longer have to hold gold behind their deposits. They can hold Bank of England notes as a reserve because that's what their customers are mostly going to want if they want currency. Uh, and so it leads to centralization of gold reserves. All the gold reserves ended up in the Bank of England. And when the central bank has all the gold reserves, now it can interfere with the international mechanism that restrains their overissue, the so-called price specie flow mechanism. They can raise interest rates to keep gold from leaving the country by attracting investor gold from other <coughs> countries. Uh, in the US, the monopoly of currency doesn't take place immediately with the Federal Reserve Act in 1913. At first, uh, the Federal Reserve Act doesn't say anything about monetary policy. It does, and the, bank of the Federal Reserve System was just one of many currency issuers. And that ended in the 1930s when they decided to centralize note issue. And technically what happened was the commercial banks were required to hold a certain kind of federal bonds to get permission to issue notes. And they simply withdrew all those bonds. So do we need a central bank? There was an interesting discussion of this on The Daily Show way, way back in ancient times, uh, 2007. But Alan Greenspan went on The Daily Show to uh, promote his book. Uh, I think it was, so the financial crisis had begun. And I think the title of the book was Not My Fault by Alan Greenspan, or <laughs> something like that. The Age of Turbulence. Uh, Somebody wrote a very good question for John Stewart. He says to Alan Greenspan, and of course Alan Greenspan earlier in his career was a devotee of Ayn Rand, wrote an essay on the gold standard for a collection that Rand edited. Uh, so this is a pointed question. Stewart says, 
free market capitalism is supposed to be our economic theory, so why do we have a Fed? Wouldn't the free market take care of interest rates and all that? And Greenspan was kind of stunned. <laughs> he didn't expect a good question. But he eventually comes up with an answer, which is, well, you didn't need a central bank when we were on the gold standard. And this is not quite coherent, but you know what he's getting at. All of the automatic things occurred because people would buy and sell gold and the market would do what the Fed does now, meaning the market would regulate the quantity of money through adverse clearings and through international clearings. So the money supply was self-regulating. Now, when the U.S. was on a gold standard, it wasn't limited to the 19th century. The U.S. was on a gold standard when the Federal Reserve Act was passed and continued on a gold standard until, well, more or less uh, through the First World War. Uh, so, according to Greenspan's argument, the U.S. didn't need a central bank when the Federal Reserve Act was passed. Which, if he had said it while he was head of the Fed, <laughs> might have made headlines. Uh, but he's saying the U.S. didn't need a central bank, at least for monetary policy. And Stewart uh, drives home the point. So, you're saying we don't have a free market monetary system. And Greenspan says, that's right. If there's a central bank governing the amount of money in the system, that's not a free market. So why did we get a Federal Reserve? Well, it wasn't for monetary policy. It was to alleviate the problem of financial panics. Now, some economists know only the U.S. history and they say, okay, so you see, we needed a central bank. Well, but wait a minute. Let's look around the world. Does every country have the same kind of panics that the U.S. has? No. Canada had no panics. Canada had the same economy as the U.S., right, coast to coast, mostly agricultural. Uh, but they had a different banking system because they let banks branch nationwide and they didn't have this restriction limiting the issue of banknotes to banks that had the approved collateral of uh, federal bonds. So the U.S. system was uniquely panic prone. It was the re result of legal restrictions, not some inherent market failure. And bankers at the time understood this, some of them anyway, and called for deregulation of note issue and deregulation of branch banking. But the small bankers said, no, we don't want that because that will mean we have to compete with larger banks and we enjoy our little local monopolies that the state legislatures gave us. So they quashed it. And the small bank lobby was very powerful. When did we get interstate branch banking in the U.S. Not until the 1990s. Uh, I could tell stories about having to carry wads of cash when I went from New York to California, but for another time. So we got the Federal Reserve Act as a, an attempt to remedy the panic problem without actually removing the cause, just treating the symptoms by creating a new federal agency that will treat the symptoms. So that's why it says in the preamble it's to furnish an elastic currency because under the regulations that existed, the banks couldn't do it. If you'd let them, they could have done it, but they weren't allowed to do it. So it's a new national a federal <coughs> institution to do what the private clearinghouses had been trying to do, but they're hampered by these legal restrictions. Uh, so the original tasks of the Fed are to take over the clearing system enforce the membership standards, and issue more <coughs> notes in times of peak demand. Uh, I recommend George Selgin's account, which is uh, at alt.m, sorry, altm.org, that's the name of the blog. We were talking at dinner with the, about the, the conspiracies behind the foundation of the Fed, and there were conspiracies, there were multiple competing conspiracies, <laughs> and the leg that's true of most legislation. <laughs> That is, people are making discussions and decisions behind closed doors, and then they come out and say, here's our proposal, but a lot of things went on before they made that announcement. Uh, and the Federal Reserve Act is kind of a compromise <coughs> among different interests. So in the 20th century, central banks destroyed the gold standard during the First <coughs> World War, didn't substitute anything coherent, in the interwar period, so that was very chaotic. And I mention that because there are some economic historians who blame the Great Depression on the gold standard. But the gold standard wasn't prevailing in that period. 
it was a chaos of central banks running different kinds of systems. It wasn't the automatic gold standard, it wasn't the classical gold standard where central banks either were passive or didn't exist. Right? The U.S. didn't have a central bank before 1913. Uh, after the second world war we got an attempt to have the constraints of the gold standard by the dollar being convertible <coughs> into gold, but at the same time have freedom for central banks to run Keynesian demand management policies. And those two things were inconsistent and Bretton Woods broke down uh, 1971 and we've had pure fiat money ever since. Somebody tweeted today that uh, you know 10 plus years ago before Bitcoin came along nobody knew what the term fiat money meant. <laughs> and I commented yes I was there <laughs> and sure enough it was only gold <coughs> bugs who used the term fiat money and because of that people looked at you suspiciously if you used the phrase fiat money like you were some kind of conspiracy nut. <coughs> fiat money just means money issued by government that's not redeemable for anything. Uh, a banknote under the gold standard is an IOU, it's a debt claim. A Federal Reserve note today is an IOU nothing. <laughs> well if you take a 20 to the Fed and say you know I'd like to redeem this they'll give you two tens. But that's about it. So what are our options? We could try to institute a private decentralized gold standard and that would from the historical record we know that would give us a stable purchasing power of money so that would be good. But we have to come up with some better way of safeguarding the gold standard from being taken over by the government. And it's vulnerable because when you have vaults of gold they're kind of obvious. Uh, they can be surrounded by soldiers. A Bitcoin standard has the virtue that it's less vulnerable. You can hide Bitcoin better than you can hide gold vaults. Uh, but Bitcoin is very volatile in its purchasing power and that's not just a phase, that's baked in to the way Bitcoin is designed. It's got a fixed supply so unlike a gold standard which I mentioned when the purchasing power goes up in the long run you get more gold and that brings stabilizes the purchasing power. You don't get any more Bitcoin when the price goes up. You don't get any less when the price goes down. So fluctuations in demand are entirely reflected in the price and not at all in the quantity. So that's a disadvantage if you want stable purchasing power from your money and most people do. Spontaneously switching to either of these alternatives is difficult because people going back to Menger's story about self-reinforcing popularity, people want to be paid in something they can immediately spend on the things they want to buy. You can't spend Bitcoin on very many goods and services right now, at least not legal ones. Uh, you can't spend gold on very many goods and services right now, at least not directly. Yeah, you can cash it and then spend but now you're using the dollar. So it's hard to achieve a critical mass although a modest first step would be to eliminate the legal obstacles like taxing capital gains on Bitcoin and gold as if they were commodities rather than monies. But we treated them the same way we treat bank accounts denominated in euros or Swiss francs. Uh, that would help. So that's more than enough from me. I will take questions in case I said anything controversial. <laughs> Right. prior to the establishment of the Fed and that a big piece of the Great Depression chain of mistakes was that the Fed failed to be that lender of last resort, uh, especially in that fir first market crash uh, and all the banks going out of business. So could you talk a little bit about that and the private alternative to the Fed? Yeah, in the, in the picture of the Federal Reserve Act preamble, a phrase I didn't read was to provide means for rediscounting to banks and that's the lender of last resort role. If banks need more liquidity, more reserves, they were supposed to be able to take their eligible assets and sell them to the Fed. 
and get cash, get <laughs> reserves for them. Uh, and that was a kind of standby function. It wasn't meant to be an everyday thing. It was when there was a financial crisis and the banks were being pressed by customers who were running on them, the Fed would make more reserves available. Um, I would distinguish between the sort of old-fashioned view of the lender of last resort, which is that its job is to rescue institutions, and a more modern view, which is that really their job is to prevent the money supply from shrinking as a result of uh, liquidity problems, bank runs, basically. And so you can do that, the central bank can do that without picking which institutions to rescue and which ones not to rescue. Because when you give it that job, it's a recipe for favoritism and cronyism and we'll protect the banks that we like and we'll let the banks we don't like fail. We'll protect Bear Stearns because we like them and we'll let Lehman Brothers fail, when in fact they both should have failed. Uh, but in the early year, in, in the Great Depression, there was, although the Fed was supposed to eliminate financial panics, there were a series of banking panics. Uh, some people say four, some say five, but periods where there were high, a spike in interest rates, people <laughs> running on banks, and it's true, the Fed did not rescue those banks. Well, those banks really didn't deserve to be rescued because they were insolvent, by and large. And so what the Fed should have done, assuming we've got the Fed, uh, what the Fed should have done besides cease to exist, uh, to play the lender of last resort role in the way it needed to be played was to uh, offset the tendency for the money supply to shrink by engaging in expansionary open market operations, which the Fed knew how to do at that point. But the Fed was sitting on plenty of gold they could have afforded to lose that gold. They were well above their gold, own gold reserve requirement, uh, but they didn't do that. So that was the failure that Milton Friedman famously laid at the door of the Fed, and Ben Bernanke uh, confessed, well, not, not when he was chairman, but before that, when he was a member of the Board of Governors at a birthday party for Milton Friedman, he said, yep, we failed, but thanks to you, Professor Friedman, we won't do it again. Well. Bernanke, in fact, was in charge of the Fed in 2009 when there, it wasn't as big as the Great Depression, obviously, but there was a big contraction in the economy that if the Fed had <coughs> responded more promptly, it could have moderated. So uh, I did a study of the sort of 100-year history of the Fed together with George Selgin and Bill Lestraps, uh, Bill Lestraps being the econometrician of the group, and we produced evidence that uh, the variation in real output in the economy, which is sort of the measure of how bad business cycles are, isn't any better today than it was before the Fed was founded. And yet the economy is much more diversified, so you think it would be an easier task to stabilize the economy, and yet the economy is no more stable at the aggregate level. So the Fed has not done that job successfully. On the other hand, the Fed has been very successful at creating inflation. Yeah? Uh, what do you think will happen to the demand for gold, silver, and cryptocurrency if the government continues to go more toward a central banking, banking system? So I'm not a registered investment advisor, however. <laughs> yeah, so gold, uh, after it was demonetized, has become an inflation hedge and more generally a tail risk hedge. So bad times and high inflation, people pile into gold. And now Bitcoin is playing that role too. Uh, so if, when people become more concerned about the inflation we're already <coughs> starting to see, then historical patterns suggest that they will pile into gold and possibly into Bitcoin. So that gives them upside potential. Uh, it's hard to say exactly how much inflation expectation is already priced into them. So I don't have any magnitude to tell you, but the more concerned people become about inflation and about the instability of the financial system, the more you'll see them acquire those sort of hedges against the worst case scenario. 
Karen. Can you comment a little bit on why the excess reserves of banks went from $2 billion to $2.5 trillion? Okay. So fortunately, I teach a course in money and banking, so I actually have to know this stuff. <laughs> so the, it used to be that banks held very small reserves because they earned no interest on reserves, whereas they could earn you know, pretty healthy interest rates on securities or on mortgages or on other kinds of loans. So it was costly to hold reserves. And so banks held the minimum they were required to hold, which as you said was a few billion dollars. Uh, then the financial crisis comes along and two things change. One, the Fed begins to engage in quantitative easing, but not coincidentally, the Fed at the same time begins to pay interest on reserves. So in a s very real sense, the Fed is borrowing from the banking system. In order to do what? In order to enlarge its portfolio. Why do they want to do that? Well, look at the change in the composition of the portfolio. They stop buying just treasury bills and start buying mortgage-backed securities. So this, I asked my friends at the Fed, what are they doing? What is Bernanke's theory? And they said, Bernanke has this theory that the banks have a social value over and above the value of their share price indicates. So we need to subsidize the banks. How are we going to do that? Well, they stand to lose from a fall in the more price of mortgage-backed securities. That would impair bank capital. So we're going to prop up the price of mortgage-backed securities by buying a trillion, a trillion and a half, I think it's now two and a half trillion uh, in mortgage-backed securities. And we're also going to try to help bring down 30-year rates relative to other rates by changing the composition of the treasuries we buy. Before the crisis, the Fed's portfolio of treasuries had a maturity of about five years on average. Now it's about 12 years because they want to bring down long rates. They want to buy treasuries, bid up their prices, bid down their yields. And for some reason, uh, so the Fed's portfolio went before the crisis from, uh, its ass total assets went from 800 billion to over 4 trillion. And to finance those assets, they have banks holding huge amounts. Well, to finance that without causing proportional expansion of the money supply and therefore inflation, they pay the banks to sequester the reserves they've created by paying enough interest that the banks hold on to them instead of lending them out. And they redoubled that strategy during the pan pandemic. The Fed's portfolio went over $8 trillion and bank reserves went up even more. So that's the situation we're in. We're in a system where bank reserves are essentially not scarce. So the money supply process works differently. I had to tear up all my lecture notes and write new lecture notes about the Fed's new operating system. Uh, but that's the reason. The banks are being paid to hold those reserves enough that they don't lend them out in order to finance the Fed's expanded portfolio. Yvonne. I think it's important for the students to understand that the Fed is really <coughs> playing with us as kind of lab rats, right? <laughs> we are all but little experimental mice in their grand experiments, right? And that these things... You, may, you, you call it an experiment like they've planned ahead. <laughs> <laughs> but I think people, you know, it's, it's not easy stuff to understand, right? And um, most people, their eyes kind of glaze over when you start talking about that stuff. But this has massive impact on everybody's lives. And, uh, and I just really want to make sure that, you know, people understand that here. So the, the, the Bernanke quote that you were alluding to at uh, Milton Friedman's 90th birthday party, right. what he was actually fessing up to is that the Fed was responsible for, the, for, the, for causing the Great Depression, which is uh, you know, uh, this event that caused an immense amount of human misery. Mm -hmm. right? and, um, and this is what they all, of course, they say that they're going to ensure that we avoid that kind of human misery. But of course, um, they have not done that. And in fact, there is the stagflation of the 70s. And God knows what's happening, what's coming next, right? That, uh, this is really, the central banking has, does have a terrible record, not just of economic instability, but of causing human misery. 
Whereas free banking, because it's so decentralized, diffused, does not. If there is failure, it's very localized, right? Right. So I just wanted to you know, bring it up and have you comment on it. Yeah, no, you make a good point. But seriously, the Fed, it, you, it, calling it an experiment kind of overlooks the, the real fact, which is they're making it up as they go along. And this new system of monetary uh, policy, uh, where they have super abundant reserves and they vary the interest rate on reserves to make the system tighter or looser, there wasn't a lot of planning that went into implementing that. It was on the fly. Well, we got to prop up, <coughs> Bernanke thinks we have to prop up the price of housing. So to do that, we need to prop up the price of mortgage-backed securities. So how are we going to do that? We got to buy a trillion of them. But we don't want that to cause great inflation, so how do we sop up the extra reason? So they made it up as they went along. And some, well, not many people who work for the Fed obviously will admit that it was a mistake, but people who have retired from the Fed, most of them will tell you that was a mistake, but they won't take it back because it would make them look bad. So there's all this bureaucratic inertia and face saving that goes on when you are not a profit-making institution or profit-seeking institution, but you're a bureaucracy. <coughs> so that's yet another reason to want money supply in the hands of people who have a profit motive in giving up what doesn't work and embracing what does work. Uh, but yeah, it, the, there is a very real human uh, tragedy associated with big swings in the economy, and the Fed has not prevented that suffering when they had the means to do it. If they had taken the best advice that was available at the time, but of course there's lots of bad advice also available at the time. In a private system, banks have an incentive to seek out and find the best advice. Central <laughs> bank, not so much incentive. Plus they've got another uh, incentive to follow, which is they're part of the federal government, and they are team players. And so they don't act as independently as they sometimes say from the fiscal authorities. So the Treasury needs to borrow more money. We can do that. That, of course, is why the Bank of England was created. And now the Fed is, although it claimed to be independent for many years, has stepped <laughs> into that role of supporting the financing needs of the Treasury. And during the pandemic, the Fed and the Treasury actually formed a partnership, the so-called Main Street Lending <laughs> Program. Fortunately, they never lent very much money that way, but it's a bad precedent because now they can say, well, of course we have to cooperate with the Treasury. That's our tradition now. Uh, so they're not insulated from politics. And that gives them all kinds <laughs> of incentives to worry about the short run and not about what's in the permanent progressive interests of mankind. Yeah, so it's a, it's a bad incentive system all around. Uh, so even people who sincerely want to make the world a better place and go to work for the central bank thinking that's what they'll be able to do, uh, find out it doesn't quite work that way. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. White. <laughs> Thank you, Ben. Sure. Okay. I don't know whether you follow up on the discussion.